I think we all know that a November 24th deadline for the current nuclear talks with Iran is, is fast approaching, and the Obama administration seems determined, if not obsessed, with getting a deal with Iran as a legacy item uh, for this administration. Um, we don't know whether these talks will be extended or not, but I think we, we know that there is quite, quite an effort by the administration to get a deal, and there's growing concern on Capitol Hill about the direction of these talks. The purpose of the talks, which have been conducted uh, uh, since early this year, is to give Iran an opportunity to prove that its nuclear program is peaceful and to create conditions in a final agreement. So if Iran makes a dash to a bomb, the timeline will be significantly lengthened. Well, the purpose of my presentation today is to explain that the talks under discussion are not going to achieve either of these objectives, and specifically that the Iranian nuclear program is much further along than the Obama administration has admitted. So there's four points I want to make at the outset. Uh, why the nuclear talks will produce an agreement harmful to U.S. national security. First of all, Iran will still be capable of making enough nuclear fuel from its large enriched uranium stockpile for at least eight nuclear weapons. And that number is probably higher, and I'm going to explain why. Iran will be able to construct its first nuclear weapon in four months or less under what's being discussed in the multilateral talks. Iran will not be required to halt construction of the Iraq heavy water reactor, which will be a source of plutonium. That was a long time demand by the West. We're now allowing Iran to continue to work on this reactor, and I'm going to talk about uh, our conditions for this, which are fairly weak. But I think the most important concern that Congress needs to think about is that Iran has refused to cooperate with the IEA during this year's talks, allow IEA inspectors full access to its nuclear facilities, or answer, answer outstanding questions about the military dimensions of its nuclear program. This ha leads us to, to wonder if there is a final agreement with Iran on its nuclear program. Since Iran did not cooperate with the IEA during the talks, how can we trust it to cooperate with the IE to verify its compliance with a final deal, assuming that there is one? I first want to talk about uranium enrichment. This is the most immediate threat from the Iranian nuclear program. There's two routes to a nuclear weapon, the uranium route and the plutonium route. Uh, Iran is on the brink of producing weapons-grade fuel from its uranium stockpile, so I want to go over that first. The first thing it's worth noting with the uranium enrichment program of Iran is how dramatically American policy has changed under this administration. In 2003, our conditions were fairly clear, and this, this was the same until May of 2012. No enrichment. Iran can't enrich uranium. Iran has to stop installing centrifuges to enrich uranium. In May 2012, we proposed to the Iranians that they could continue to enrich to reactor grade as long as they uh, stopped enriching to the 20 percent enriched uranium level. Now, what does that mean? Uranium enrichment is the process of increasing the percentage of the rare isotope uranium-235, which is fissile, which, which means it can undergo a nuclear reaction, to concentrate that level so it can be used either as nuclear fuel in a reactor or in a nuclear weapon. 3 to 5 percent enriched uranium is enough to run a nuclear reactor. It has to be enriched to about 90 percent for a nuclear bomb. Iran had been enriching some uranium to the 20 percent level for a research reactor in Tehran. Experts sort of doubt that's what Iran was really doing because they had enriched far more uranium to the 20 percent level than they would ever need for this reactor. Um, the Obama administration has tried to claim that getting Iran to agree to stop enriching to the 20 percent level was a significant achievement because 20 percent enriched uranium is much more dangerous than a reactor grade. That isn't true, but I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Last November, we took this further. We said that Iran can continue to enrich the reactor grade, but any new uranium had to be converted to uranium dioxide. And the argument was made, well, this is a significant achievement because this will set back the ability of Iran to turn reactor-grade uranium into weapons-grade. Uh, experts who I've talked to and, 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 and uh, uh, researched have said this will only delay Iran's ability to make weapons-grade uranium by two weeks. They can easily convert any uranium converted to uranium dioxide 
back into uranium hexafluoride, that's the feed product for, their, for the centrifuges, in about two weeks. Recently, this has got even worse. Over the, over the last few weeks, we've seen a series of proposals by the Obama administration to move Iran to a deal by allowing it to enrich uranium using more and more centrifuges. We first heard the number 1,500 centrifuges, then 6,000. Iran has about 11,000 centrifuges, 9,000 are operable right now. Now, with 6,000 centrifuges, Iran could make about a weapon's worth of reactor-grade uranium per year, which it could change into weapons-grade in just a few weeks. So let's talk about the timeline. This is very important because there's been a lot of confusion about this. Now, using Iran's 9,000 operable centrifuges, they can make reactor-grade uranium in about 4.5 to 7 months. And I might add, this slide is going to be on our website, so you can print it out and take a look at it, and I hope you'll distribute it widely. Iran can go from reactor grade to weapons grade in 2.2 to 3.5 months. Now, I want to add something important here. These figures are not the worst case scenario. They are low end estimates of 6,860 6, 6, SWU, which, which represents the output of a centrifuge. Many experts believe Iran's centrifuge efficiency could be 37 percent higher, which means that this timeline could be substantially shorter. So let's talk about the difference between reactor-grade uranium and 20 percent enriched uranium. The jump between 3.5 percent and 20 percent you can see is pretty slight. And the reason for this, the reason why it takes so much longer to enrich from natural uranium to the reactor grade level and such a short period of time to go from reactor grade to uh, weapons grade is that uranium enrichment is nonlinear. Most of the work is done at the early stages of enrichment. As you enrich to higher levels, significantly less work is needed to, to do this. Now let's talk about how many weapons Iran could make out of its enriched uranium. And this is also something that's controversial. There's many uh, debates over what this means. The blue line is how much enriched uranium in kilograms Iran has enriched since 2008. The green line is how many weapons it could make out of this enriched uranium if further enriched to weapons grade, which it could do in a couple of weeks. Now, the, the red line represents enriched uranium available. Now, the IEA started counting Iran's enriched uranium differently a couple of years ago because it was, down, it was converting some of its enriched uranium into uranium dioxide. It was converting some of its reactor grade uranium into 20 percent enriched uranium, and some of the 20 percent enriched uranium was being made into fuel plates for the uh, Tehran research reactor. Now, if you look at the figures from 2012, 13, and 14, experts I've talked to said that we could reasonably estimate that Iran could actually make several more weapons than those figures if, they, if Iran were to recover enriched uranium it is converted into other forms. But I'm, as I said, this is not a worst case scenario. This is, a, this is basically a conservative estimate, so I'm basically saying uh, based on the 12,772 kilograms of enriched uranium at the reactor grade Iran has right now, a little over 8,000 the IAEA says is available, Iran could make about eight weapons if it further enriched its reactor grade uranium to weapons grade. Now there's another issue here. The, the Obama administration has said, well, we will try to get Iran not to have a lot of operating centrifuges, and that will significantly slow the timeline for enrichment. Well, as I said earlier, uranium enrichment is nonlinear. Not only does it take less time to enrich from reactor grade to weapons grade, it takes substantially fewer centrifuges. Now, one of the uh, proposals was that Iran only be allowed to operate 1,500 centrifuges. This would be more than enough for Iran to enrich its large reactor grade uranium stockpile to weapons grade. And that would mean they could make 8,000 weapons without any problem with 1,500 or less centrifuges. And if they're going to have the number which is being discussed right now, 6,000, that's the estimate we've heard lately. We're, we're looking at uh, the capability of making more weapons and making more weapons faster. 
Now, as I said, there, there are two routes to a nuclear weapon. There's also the plutonium route. Now, plutonium is a very valuable nuclear fuel because it has a lower uh, critical mass. That means you need substantially less of it, maybe only a quarter as much by weight for a nuclear bomb. And that's important when making a, a missile warhead or a cruise missile. Our position on plutonium production has also changed substantially under this administration. Until last November, we were saying construction of the Iraq heavy water reactor, which has been worked on in defiance of numerous Security Council resolutions, has to stop. Well, last November, we agreed to allow Iran to continue to work on the reactor, this reactor, as long as it was not activated. We're now talking about allowing Iran to finish construction of the reactor under scenarios where this reactor would produce less plutonium. Now, there's two scenarios for doing this. The first one is converting it into a light water reactor. If that was done, it would be hard to use this reactor to make a substantial amount of plutonium in a way that would not be uh, detectable and easily extracted. But Iran has rejected that proposal. The other proposal is to fuel this reactor with uh, uh, low and rich uranium. Uh, if that was to be done, it would, the reactor would produce less plutonium as a byproduct in its spent fuel rods, but it would be easily reversible. Making it into a light water reactor would mean retooling it in a way that would be hard to reverse. If the final proposal calls for Iran to fuel this reactor with low and rich uranium, it will be an unbelievably dangerous sellout by the West. So I hope everyone on the Hill will be watching that very carefully. Really, the only thing to do with this reactor is it should be shut down. Iran does not need a reactor that will produce plutonium. This reactor is expected to be completed by 2016. It will produce about two weapons worth of plutonium per year from its spent fuel rods. And as I said, the alterations that are being proposed, the one that Iran will probably accept, uh, are easily reversible. Now, there's some other serious issues with the talks that I wanted to mention. They have ignored the, the delivery system for a nuclear weapon. There, there's, there's three legs to a nuclear program. There's warhead construction, and we know that Iran has been involved in that, that involve, has been involved in explosive testing re, that appears to be related to warhead construction. The IEA has documents that appear to be related to the design of a nuclear warhead. The second leg is building a delivery system, ICBMs. We know Iran is well on its way to developing a capable missile delivery system for nuclear weapons. Missiles are not being talked about in the, in the current talks. The talks have offered Iran billions in sanctions relief and will lead, to a significant, will lead to significantly more relief from U.S. sanctions after a final deal is negotiated. The United States is, is already talking about how the, the President will start issuing more exemptions once a deal is finalized. And once these sanctions are lift, both by the United States and Europe, it's going to be very difficult to put them back in place if Iran does not comply with the deal. And, and as I think you all know, the President reportedly plans to implement this deal over the objections with Congress and without consulting Congress. It isn't a treaty. It's not subject to ratification by the Senate. But the President seems prepared to go forward with a treaty, or with an agreement, I'm sorry, that has strong bipartisan opposition in Congress. But there's something that's of more concern, which I mentioned uh, earlier, that Iran has defied two crucial requirements of the nuclear talks, cooperation with the IAEA and transparency. Now, a major condition of the talks was that Iran was supposed to cooperate with the IAEA permit IAEA inspectors full access to nuclear sites and answer all outstanding questions about possible nuclear weapons research and development. The IAEA has, has issued several reports since the nuclear talks began saying that Iran has simply refused to answer outstanding issues over the military dimensions of its nuclear program. The New York Times reported on October 31st that Iran had stopped answering the agency's questions about sus suspected past efforts to design the components of a bomb. So I, I, I again say that if Iran would not cooperate during the talks with the IAEA, how can we expect the IAEA to verify a final agreement that Iran is complying with, with a final agreement? It's, it, it simply doesn't make any sense. So as bad as this is, 
in addition to not cooperating with the IAEA, Iran has been cheating on the interim agreement that was uh, uh, agreed to last November. The parties to the agreement last November said Iran cannot develop its advanced centrifuges, cannot install new centrifuges. Well, before the talks began early this year, Iran was caught developing and installing advanced centrifuges, and this delayed the start of the talks for several weeks. Well, to resolve this issue, the U.S. and its European allies said Iran can continue to experiment with certain advanced centrifuge designs, but cannot test them with uranium hexafluoride. Basically, they can run dry tests. They can't put uranium in these advanced centrifuges. The IAEA reported in, on November 7th that Iran has been testing advanced centrifuges with uranium. They were caught cheating. They were given a pass. And then they cheated again. So in addition to not cooperating with the IAEA, Iran has been defying it and the international community by developing advanced centrifuges. And this is important because assuming we get an agreement with Iran that limits it to 1,500, 4,500, 6,000 centrifuges, if Iran can replace those centrifuges, which are primitive, they're called, they're called uh, IR1s, they're, 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 they're an older design, they're prone to breakdown. If they can install advanced centrifuges that are four to six or more times more efficient and less prone to breakdown, they'll be able to make significantly more enriched uranium uh, much faster. So our bottom line here is that Congress must repudiate the nuclear talks. Um, our view is that we've made so many one-sided concessions to Iran that these talks can't be salvaged. They have drifted so far from reality, we're now looking at an agreement that is going to undermine U.S. national security, is going to undermine security in the region. Um, and is going to create a situation where the sanctions that have had some effect in moving Iran and in limiting the nuclear program will be lifted and uh, Iran will be able to continue with its program. One condition of these talks that isn't talked about very much is that last November the U.S. agreed that there would be a sunset clause, meaning that the talks would have a limited, the agreement would have a limited duration after which Iran would be treated as a normal state. It would be allowed to engage in whatever nuclear activities it wished as long as it told the IAEA, just like any, any other country. Iran is pushing for that agreement to only last 10 years or less. The U.S. is talking double digits. Um, it's sort of frightening that we may have a weak agreement that only be, may be in place for 10 years or less. Congress must repudiate this agreement. Congress must pass new sanctions insisting that Iran abide by all existing UN Security Council resolutions. This has to mean no enrichment, stop work on the Iraq heavy water reactor, cooperate with the IEA, and allow IE inspectors full access to its nuclear facilities. Uh, this, this was our position for years until last November when we made these extraordinary concessions to get Iran to the negotiating table. And then we made even more concessions to get us to an agreement that the administration may try to sign later this, later this month. So this is, a, this is a dangerous situation. I think it's important that we get the message out on Capitol Hill about how bad this deal is, about how this isn't an agreement that we should be even discussing or negotiating. This is an agreement which should be rejected because the talks are a sellout, that they're based on uh, unconscionable compromises by the United States. Um, a, a letter by a number of national security professionals was sent around by the Center for Security Policy this morning. Um, we're going to str we've sent this, it's calling on Congress to repudiate the talks and to pass new sanctions. I hope that'll make a difference. And, um, you know, I hope all of you can help in getting the message out about uh, what a bad situation this is. So thank you. Fred, thank you. Look, this is um, obviously a tough slog here. Uh, the administration has the whip hand. It is uh, inexorably moving forward. Uh, it is being... Uh, treated with abject contempt by the Iranians, and yet it is evidently determined whether it's out of a consideration of legacy, and I've 
like Maury Amate have been around enough administrations when they get into that legacy mode that you know uh, Katie barred the door, as they say, is, is generally the practice. But um, I think what you've laid out, Fred, is, is so, uh, so damning, really, um, so frightening and such a, a, a radical departure from what has been a bipartisan consensus on these issues for years in the Congress specifically, that um, it is certainly necessary to try to encourage people to uh, repudiate this agreement before it is completed. Uh, we know there are some like the Truman Center who have made known their intent to promote this treaty before it is completed. Um, I don't know how you can make the case for it if you don't even know what's in it, but we know enough about what's not in it or what is going to be in it that is fundamentally um, unacceptable that I think we are in a position to, uh, to say now, stop, uh, this is not acceptable. So with that, let's open it up to questions and comments uh, for Fred and um, any particular, any thoughts you might have on what we can do at this point to bring this message to the largest possible audience? Maury? I think there's a feeling in, in Congress, and I've spoken to some of the uh, leadership since the election, that they really can't stop the president from signing the agreement. But in terms of what they could do, is perhaps a joint resolution, both houses uh, re repudiating it. Uh, as far as getting new sanctions legislation through, I think that would take much longer, particularly if we're looking at something before the uh, deadline. And I would hope that some people have been approached in both houses with regard to a joint resolution. I think a joint resolution would be very useful because it could convince the Iranians to pull out. I think sanctions would be best. Leg strong legislation pushing sanctions would be best. I just think any, anything from, from the Hill, even if the President vetoes it, sends a message to the Europeans and to the Iranians that Congress isn't behind this. And I think it could have an effect on, on the talks. Let me just mention one other thing while we're sort of taking stock here. Um, whatever they do, there there is seemingly one ultimate opportunity, and that is to use the power of the purse to prevent this kind of agreement from being implemented. But in order to do that, the Congress has to preserve the option not to fund things in this coming, or well, what's left of this present fiscal year, I should say. Um, one of the concerns on that score is that the Republican leadership, to say nothing of the Democratic leadership, seems hell-bent to do either a long-term continuing resolution or a, an omnibus even that would essentially foreclose the parse from being, um, uh, you know, restricted in this respect. I'd be interested particularly for anybody on the Hill who might have insights in that or maybe more you do on where where this issue stands. I, I know there have been some strong objections raised to this from uh, members of Congress, but uh, I, I sure hope there's enough to overcome the seeming momentum behind foreclosing that option. No, I don't think so. The, the, the idea that I've heard is you go ahead and you put together all of the other pieces of the necessary government funding and you enact those uh, or you enact them all for three months and then you enact under new management the other pieces and you don't do this piece. So it comes, it's in a way the same thing as with the amnesty business, that you can simply not fund the thing that is objectionable. But the rest of the government being funded should be something that unless the president refuses to sign legislation funding it, in which case he's closing the government, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a different kettle of fish. It, it concerns me that there's, approach, uh, there's an approach by some on the Hill to come up with a checklist to, to assess whether this is a good deal or not. And, and I don't think we should let it get that far. 
I think it's more important to say, you know, we made unacceptable compromises even to start these talks. We shouldn't be pretending that those compromises will be rolled back for a good deal that's going to come out later this month. We already know from the leaks from the, from the uh, talks over the last couple of months, we've made appalling concessions to Iran. Even the Washington Post said we've made disturbing counterproposals to Iran to get to where we are. So I think it's important to, to just tell every member of Congress we simply have to say enough. We don't care what comes out of these talks. We shouldn't have made the compromises to even begin them. We have to start over. Tony? I know the hour is late and that he is uh, in the process of doing this. But my, my question is, um, what is the rest of the world doing about this? And are, are they aware of what he is doing in making these uh, concessions? Uh, particularly, of course, Israel should be uh, uh, getting ready and for the, for the kind of, I'm sure they're always ready, but the, uh, to, to, move it, to move it forward even further if these concessions are, are given. Uh, but what about the rest of the world who do not wish Iran to have a nuclear weapon? Have they voiced any uh, objection about these conversations that we keep hearing and how from 208, where he is now, allowed our co his, this country to obtain what is it obtained? There's a lot of concern about the talks in the Middle East. Uh, the Saudis are very upset. There have been press reports that the Saudis could even try to acquire their own nuclear deterrent, maybe buying it from Pakistan, it, if the agreement, which they think is going to go through, goes through. The Israelis are very upset about this. Benjamin Netanyahu, when he was in this country uh, in late September, said, Iran has no need for enrichment. The only reason Iran is enriching is to make bombs. And I think he's exactly right. Mm -hmm. The Europeans have been with the Obama administration on this, which I think is unfortunate. I think they've been just as bad as, as we have. Uh, nations like the United Arab Emirates, UAE signed something called a 123 agreement. That's an agreement that certifies the nuclear program is peaceful so companies like GE can sell them nuclear technology. A requirement of a 123 is no enrichment. So we told our ally, the UAE, you cannot enrich. But just across the Gulf, the Iranians may have 6,000 uranium centrifuge machines. This is setting a very bad precedent, and it's infuriated countries like the UAE and others who signed an agreement in good faith with us on nuclear programs, saying, you know, for us to trust us, you can't enrich. And then we turn around and say to the Iranians that they can enrich. They did. Just a footnote, I know on this slide about them cheating, you probably just didn't have room, but they also cheated in the way that they're selling oil the understanding they reached with the United States that there would be limits as to the amount of oil they would sell under the relaxed sanctions regime, and they have exceeded those numbers. Uh, someone pointed out when, when in response to the question just now, what, what are the rest of the world doing? They're sending trade delegations to Iran. That's what the rest of the world is doing. <laughs> so we have to be uh, very, you know, the, the, historically the French have been concerned about the Iraq reactor like we have been. But it does not appear that those concerns are uh, continuing into the future. I want to welcome my friend Claudia Rosette, who is also quite an expert on the Iranian nuclear program. And you, you, I'm, I, I'll, I'll, our slides will be on the website. I'll get you a copy of them. I, I hope actually, Claudia, because you just arrived, um, and you're always welcome, needless to say, but um, you, that you might actually take this aboard uh, from Fred before you leave, because this is, uh, I think there's a lot of information, some of which, uh, as I said earlier, uh, even you may be unfamiliar with. Um, I'm going to have to leave momentarily, but I, I do want to welcome Claudia, and maybe we can impose upon you to say a few words as well about um, sort of your insights into What's happening here, there are a few people, in, as I think everybody in this room knows, uh, who are more deeply knowledgeable about uh, the perfidious nature and the scurrilous conduct of the United Nations than Claudia Rosette. One of the things that is just absolutely kind of mind warping about all of this is the Obama administration, as Fred has just documented, has now taken positions considerably weaker than those required by the UN Security Council. 
And this speaks volumes about both the content of this agreement and the dismal state of American policy making that we find ourselves now um, having even agreements or, or, or resolutions that the Russians and the Chinese, to say nothing of the Europeans, were willing to go along with to prevent Iran from getting the capabilities we are now going to legitimate them having. And Fred has touched on this 6,000 centrifuges thing. I can't conceive of the Iranians having only 6,000 centrifuges. It's unimaginable. I don't think they've got 190,000, which the Ayatollah has said he wants now, but they've certainly got more. And Claudia, maybe you or Fred could, uh, could speak to this point about how little we actually know about the full extent of this program, which has been conducted from the get-go, covertly, and it's really only because of opposition groups or the Israelis or lucky finds that we've uncovered as much about it as we have. But it's surely still just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Claudia, grab, grab a mic and say what you will. I would love, thank you, Fred. I would love to see what you have put forth. My apologies for coming in just now. Yeah, well, 6,000 centrifuges, we don't know what else Iran might have. We don't know exactly what North Korea's got, uh, you know, which is one of their close, closest allies. Uh, and is enriching uranium, having advertised it to us in 2010, having ushered one of our nuclear scientists, uh, Sig Hecker, into a uranium enrichment facility at their Yongbyon complex. Uh, and um, in the talks, maybe the thing I can add here, because I, no, I don't know what Fred actually was saying, but um, I, I went to the first, to cover the first two rounds of nuclear talks in Vienna in February and March, um, where it was already clear that this was never going to produce a good deal. Actually, it was clear when they struck the joint plan of action uh, last no a year, almost a year ago, last November, which already conceded the kinds of terms that I think you've been talking about. But it was lies and obfuscations from the get-go. The senior administration official briefing the press was asked about, were missiles on the table? Uh, no. Basically, you know, we are taking, we must, we will, we will consider everything. But you have a situation where the chief negotiator for the U.S., and it's really the U.S. that is driving this. You know, Russia and China are two of the world's biggest abettors of proliferation. They're sitting at the table enjoying this. China is the big crossroads for proliferation for Iran, for North Korea, helped Pakistan get its bomb, and so on. So they're sitting at the table. We're being told everybody's on the same page. Well, that's <laughs> if so, it's the least common denominator Frank was just talking about, where the, even the terms of the UN Security Council have become much too severe for anything that Iran would accept for a deal. Uh, we have Secretary of State John Kerry saying recently, a deal is imperative. If you've ever bargained any place, that's just not the way you come at this. <laughs> um, it's imperative I buy that rug. How much would you like for it? Um, and this has been the sort of vague yet yeah, nonsensical way in which this has been proceeding. We've now had a four-month extension. There's talk that there might be another two-month extension. Yes, the or Iran has been dealing, you can see from its shipping traffic, in far more oil than it was supposed to. They're doing very well out of this whole thing. And our chief negotiator, Wendy Sherman, who was trying desperately to get a missile deal in the final days of the Clinton administration, the last time she was a chief negotiator for an anti-proliferation deal. I've been pondering this very recently, that when she was, at that point, the Clinton administration knew that North Korea was cheating on its 1994 nuclear deal, the agreed framework. Which were, she also negotiated. Um, well, the chief negotiator for that was Bob Gallucci, 
uh, who recently held a seminar describing how the Rube North Koreans came to New York and put Tabasco sauce on their French food and quoted Gone with the Wind, which was all very camp and funny to the people who actually knew nothing about North Korea, like himself, on the team. Uh, actually, they were quoting Gone with the Wind, I think, because it's about America as a slave society, <laughs> which North Korea likes to put, put, drive home. But um, it was the Rube North Koreans who then took them for a ride. And uh, by the late 1990s, when Wendy Sherman was the lead negotiator for a missile deal, uh, they were seeing signs that North Korea was working with Pakistan's AQ Khan network for uranium enrichment. So, um, Ms. Sherman, that's the correct title, Ambassador Sherman, uh, ignored the nuclear cheating in hope of concluding a missile deal, a scene that included bringing the high, one of the highest ranking North Korean military officials to Washington, feasting him at the State Department, uh, and giving him a 45-minute sit-down face-to-face in the White House, in the Oval Office, with President Clinton. Uh, about which Wendy Sherman at the time gushed that uh, the, the Mar Vice Marshal Joe was this guy's name. He came to the State Department, symbolism matters to both the North Koreans and the Iranians in that case. Vice Marshal Joe came to the State Department uh, wearing a very nicely tailored business suit. And at the State Department asked if he could change for his meeting at the White House. He changed into his full dress military uniform, which is actually not something you want a hostile nuclear cheating totalitarian states envoy doing on the premises of the State Department. But thus arrayed, he went to the White House and had his meeting with President Clinton. Uh, Wendy Sherman described this to the press at the time as wonderful. It was so, so she was so happy to see that Vice Marshal Cho representing all segments of North Korean society <laughs> under the clearly led by the great leader Kim Jong-il had come to represent his country's desire for peace with the United States. Okay, that all fell apart because what the North Koreans actually wanted was that the American president would come as a supplicant to Pyongyang and Clinton did not do that. But Okay, having ignored the, the nuclear cheating in hopes of a missile deal, she is now ignoring Iran's missiles in hope of a nuclear deal. Uh, it seems to be, have less to do with the actual proliferation than with simply getting a deal. And one of the things that's truly alarming about this whole scene is that, that uh, Wendy Sherman has repeatedly dismissed missiles as something they're, they're not, the Iranians have said over and over, we're not going to discuss our ballistic missile program, although that is one of the things proscribed in the UN resolutions. And uh, in testimony this summer, the way that Wendy Sherman came at this was, well, if you don't have the warhead to put on the missile, what's the problem? Well, <laughs> in other words, if you don't give them bullets for the gun, why not let them keep the gun? Uh, and in this case, part of the problem is, of course, uh, that North Korea is working on these things. We have a strategy we call strategic patience, and I've heard less flattering names for it. Uh, it's not strategic in the least. We just aren't doing anything. Uh, the, the, in what what we, we may be edging up toward more talks with North Korea. That may be part of what was going on when James Clapper, head of U.S. intelligence, went to North Korea recently to pick up those two hostages. It, that would have had to be something North Korea probably asked for, certainly agreed to. Uh, so something more is in the offing there that we dignified them with a visit from him. But there are so many routes that Iran could take to the bomb. And uh, Brett Stevens had a terrific column on Monday where he went into the technical details. If you listen to, if you sit through these interminable senior administration br official briefings on the Iran nuclear talks, over and over we hear how hard they're working, day and night, teams at every tier, technical, diplomatic, have been meeting and talking. It's sort of the labor theory of value here. Uh, and um, it's all to, you know, at some point, you have a degree of complexity that nobody is outside is going to be able to follow, and Iran will cheat by degrees, and at any point, the pressure will be, what do we do if we call them on it? Anyway, that's possibly more words than you wanted, but it's a very bad scene, and it's uh, actually heading towards something, I think, quite catastrophic. Well, by the way, Wendy Sherman's up for confirmation in the Senate for a promotion. 
Wendy Sherman is up for a State Department promotion, and, and she's going to be considered during the lame duck for a, a vote. What is she going to be nominated to? Uh, assistant, whatever, I'm not sure of the next office, but in the State Department, she's up for a promotion in, to an empty slot in the State Department. So How about that? It's <laughs> almost unbelievable that in the midst of all this, she had an article in the New York Times about six months ago where she said that North Korea was different than Iran and that there's a middle class who's pushing for peace in Iran, and that's the difference. So it's kind of unbelievable that this is the person we have leading our effort. Shocking yet not surprising. Wayne? Uh, Fred, it's my understanding that the French are the number one nation in the world in terms of nuclear technology exports, and they're heavily sunk in in China, and are they similarly sunk in in, in, in Iran, and then what is, their, what is their role in all this, uh, uh, all this you know, uh, situation? My understanding is that Iran is only getting its nuclear technology from Russia. It wouldn't surprise me if they're getting some from China. I don't think the French are involved in Iran yet, but it wouldn't surprise me that French companies are looking for the end of sanctions so they could get involved in building reactors. The Iranians have said they want to build up to 10 more light water reactors, and I assume they, don't, they simply don't want the Russians to build them. The point, the point um, uh, Claudia and Frank made about what we don't know is an important one that was not in the presentation. And again, as I said, this was not a worst case scenario. Uh, I, I know from my time in the government, there's a lot of Enigma facilities in Iran. We don't know what they are. Uh, the Fordo plant, which, which is an underground enrichment facility, was discovered in 2009. It was just about to operate. Very extensive enrichment facility that U.S. intelligence knew nothing about. And as, as uh, Claudia said, North Korea built an enrichment facility uh, to enrich uranium that was oper operating. For years, the intelligence community denied that enrichment did not have an enrichment facility. Then an academic, was it in 2000, 2010? I think, Hector, 2010. It was, I think it was shortly after they sank the South Korean frigate. In late 2010, a U.S. academic and, and, and other uh, professors were shown a, a fully functional enrichment plant that the U.S. intelligence knew nothing about, and that could also be going on in Iran. Position is uh, Undersecretary of State, fourth highest ranking position in the State Department that the Sherman is up for. He's actually assumed the duties effective November 3rd. Again, why wait for the actual constitutional uh, requirement of confirmation? Um, I, I don't think we've talked yet about the status of the Americans being held in Iran, Pastor Abedini and others. Has that come up at any point during the course of these negotiations, as far as you're aware, either of you? I'm not aware that that's come up. What has come up is ISIS and the situation in Iraq and Syria, which uh, I, I've talked about this here before. Um, I don't think there's a role for Iran in Iraq and Syria other than telling uh, Iran the only way they can help with the, Syria, with, with the ISIS threat is to stop meddling in Iraqi affairs because the Iranian presence there is driving the animosity between Sunnis and Shiites. Um, I mean, if we were to discuss another issue, I think it would be a human rights issue, uh, Americans and others being held prisoner in Iran, but I'm not aware that's come up. In fairness, the Secretary Kerry has said that they always raise this with the Iranians, but that does not appear to be the case. So they claim that they always raise it. When... Yeah, if I may. Um, <laughs> the I'm sure State he's driving Department... just as hard a bargain yeah. on them as he is with the nukes. Well, as we heard recently on another front, on Obamacare, lack of transparency is a huge ad advantage in politics. And we don't actually know what's been talked about at the interminable hours, uh, not so much over a bargaining table as over the beautifully adorned coffee tables of extremely nice hotels in Vienna, Geneva, and so on. But Wendy Sherman did give a talk recently in which she said, why, of course, we care about these human rights issues, et cetera, and officially we're told this is raised. Perhaps ritually it is. But the thing that contradicts this and has also been a, very, has been a far more consistent line is that this is, they do not want to connect this with all the other issues they're just discussing the nuclear issue. That's how they even managed to hive off missiles, which you want ballistic missiles to deliver the nuclear bombs. That's why Iran is working on these things, mainly. But um, in other words, it's very unclear 
whether what they're actually discussing in any way conforms to what they're telling us. ISIS has crept into the picture despite disavowals a few months ago. You know, we would never drag that into this. Then comes the presidential letter. Uh, they seem to be talking about just about anything that they think might get Iran to strike a deal. And we have no access to what's actually being said at the table. So. Yes, sir. Adam? Oh, speaking of this, uh, there is this article from uh, the Monitor in which uh, this Iranian says there are contradictions between the contents of the letters that were sent by the presidents and the public positions of the U.S. Well, I, I know the administration will refuse to give them out, but I would think the intel committees would want to get a copy of these letters to see, to compare and contrast. And there's no reason, if, if I were in charge, that I wouldn't do this just to cause problems for them. Yeah, makes sense. Well, yeah, but they can fight. Other comments?